For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Ed Regensburg. I'm the founding pastor of Faith Community. And I have to tell you, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, that is just such a beautiful... You know, they show... I don't know anything about that movie. And I had tears in my eyes just watching that thing when they were singing about forgiveness. So um, uh, really, really a blessing. Uh, also, my wife said, what are you going to wear tomorrow? I said, I'm going to wear what I usually wear, blue jeans and my tennis shoes and, you know, hang my shirt out. And she said, well, you can't do that. You're going to be up on stage. You should dress up and wear khakis and wear a tie. And so these guys get up here and they got blue jeans on and everything. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to go home between services and put my blue jeans on, but I didn't. Anyway, happy 40th birthday. Hey, we got some guys up here with Bibles, and uh, we are going to be looking in an Old Testament book back in the Minor Prophets, white pages of the Bible, so you might want to grab one of these because I'll give you the page number so you can get there. It's going to be in Hosea, but uh, they're going to pass these out. If you need a Bible for the service, slip your hand up and uh, take that, and we encourage you. If you don't have a Bible at home or you can't find yours or something happened along the way over the years, take this one home with you and read it. Uh, we really believe that there is amazing truth in God's Word. Um, this morning I want to answer the question or try to answer part of the question of why Faith Community Church, but I thought it would be interesting to start off with this question. I didn't know how this was going to go over in the first service. I was looking around thinking, oh man, this, I, that, this might not work, but we're going to try it in this service too. It, did, it amazingly did work, and uh, what I'm going to ask you in a minute is to raise your hand and hold it up if you're 39 years old or younger. Okay, now remember, we're in church. Some of you may have been 39 for the past three years or something like that. But if you're 39 years old or younger, raise your hand and hold it up. Okay, and I want you to just look around. I'm, I don't know why I'm raising my hand, but I, <laughs> look around at the hands. Okay, you can put them down. Now remember, we had two services, and there was at least that many people in the first service. So I asked Amy, because she's such a great record keeper, I said, Amy, how many people do we have in children's church? And she said between nursery and fifth grade, there are 221 active kids on the roll. And I look at that and I say, this is, this is exciting. You know, those who study such things tell us that there are about 1,000 churches that start up, 1,000 startups a year in the United States. That sounds like a great number, but you know there are four to 7,000 churches that close their doors every single year in this country. Half the, con the churches in this country are 50 people or less. So we may not be a mega church, but I'll tell you what, this shows me. I mean, there's all a bunch of people. They weren't even born yet when Faith Community Church started, and here they are. This church has life, and this church has some activity, and there's something going on here that's very, very special, spiritual life. I was digging around in my desk drawer, and uh, I, I keep all kinds of stuff. I don't know why I don't get rid of some of these things, but I have records back from the first day when we started Faith Community Church. I have a little notebook, and I would write in there how many people and the offering and all that kind of stuff. And the first Sunday was September 10th, 1978, and we put out a sign, and uh, we had it printed, and we put it out in front of what was then St. John's Chapel, which is now Arundel Baptist Church, which is on 175. If you go past that church and you look at it, who is that <laughs> young people? That's my daughter. She was 11 months old. Today is her birthday. So you do the math, okay? But she's here. Happy, <laughs> happy birthday, Melissa. But that church was half the size when we started in it that it is today. They've expanded it out about twice as uh, large. And there was an elderly Episcopalian congregation that met there, and they would meet there at 10 o'clock, and then they would leave, and we'd come in at 11 o'clock, and we held our first service. Had no idea who was going to show up. We had a small group of people who were having Bible study in a house, and we said, okay, let's, let's have a kickoff here. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of advertising or a lot of ways to get the word out. And you know what? There were 39 people that were there that first Sunday. It was officially lost. It was a family of four that, that came that was invited by someone else. They didn't know the Lord, but they were looking and seeking, and they all came to know Christ, and they're all uh, actively uh, living for the Lord today. But um, that, that was exciting. Our first offering was $230. Pastors care about that stuff, right? We, we write that stuff down. In the coming weeks, attendance moved up into the 40s. It even hit 54 one Sunday. Now I'm thinking, oh man, you know, a couple of years, we'll have 1,000 people, 54, that is great. And so God says, Ed, you need to be humbled 
And a couple of weeks later, we had a record attendance of 18 people <laughs> in the church. And uh, I think it was about six families. The first year, we gave $855 to missions because we wanted to be mission-minded from the beginning. And they paid me an average of $118 per week. That building had no air conditioning. It had hard pews. It sat about 60 people in, in those pews. Back then, that was the U.S. Navy dairy farm that was across. That's now Horizons Farm. And they raised dairy cattle there. And then they got all the milk and the ice cream and everything for the dairy farm. Boy, when we were downwind of the dairy farm in the summertime, some of you know uh, what, that can, uh, what that can do. That can hit you. But uh, we had um, a one, there was one room there where we met in. And then there was one room in the back. And so we said, we need classrooms. And so we hung wires across, and we stretched these wires across, and we put bed sheets up there to make four classrooms. Now, those of you who have ever taught a class, can you imagine if you're teaching a class, and there's a class right beside you, and then there's one over here and one over here, and the only thing that separates you from them is a bed sheet, you know? That was the kind of things that we experienced. There was a, uh, we needed a, a nursery, right? So there's a little foyer thing in the back that led to the, the restrooms, the men's room and the ladies' room, one person each, water heater back there. That was the nursery. So every time someone needed to use the restroom, they walked through the nursery. And if you're a nursery worker, you can imagine just how exciting uh, that was. Well, here's the amazing thing. People came and people stayed. That was the amazing thing. Well, from there, we moved to Arundel Senior High School. We met in the band room. There were some other things that went on between there. We didn't want to buy that building. It went up for sale. We moved in the, in the band room. That's my dad sitting there with the glasses on. That was a long time ago. That must have been a, an anniversary Sunday. But there was no air conditioning in Arundel Senior High School back then. And we were in the... Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and we met in the band room. The band room has no windows. It has one door on the end. And so in the summertime, we'd have like, you know, I don't know, 10, 12 box fans all humming along, you know, and I'm trying to preach over those. The skylight leaked. We had, the, the, there was a big room. I was down on the floor and everybody else was sitting up on the risers, which I kind of liked that idea. And the other little white church, I was like way up, you know, looking down on everybody, which I think is a wrong approach approach. Uh, you know, I like the looking up kind of imagery uh, of that. But uh, I would speak to them, and there was a room behind me, and there was all these band instruments and things that were kept in that room. And once in a while, during the service, while I'm standing there preaching, and the only way in and out is past me, right? If you have to go to the bathroom, you have to walk past me. But the, um, the, there's that room back there, the band director would come in. And he'd rumble around in there and do all this stuff in that room while I'm standing up there preaching. The band didn't come in often because the band doesn't do things on Sundays normally. It must have been parades or something twice. And they came in, the whole band came in <laughs> while we're having service. And they're all in their uniforms and they're getting their instruments out of that room. But, you know, there's drums and stuff up there and they got some other stuff. You know, they're walking around through the people to get the stuff. There's cheerleaders with little short skirts walking around. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm down here. You know, everybody look down here. But... Uh, Th that, was, that was what we were experiencing. That, that was, it was really good for the building fund, I have to tell you that. But we, <laughs> there was an interesting thing that happened after one of our services. We had a couple, who I hope is not here today, but we had a couple who had attended a couple of times in the little white church, and they, they hadn't, I hadn't seen them for a while, and they came to the band room, and they sat through a service, hard chairs, you know, nothing, in, you know, like, creature comforts in that band room and after they were walking out after the service was over the guy says to me tell you what he says call me when you get a real church and you know the first thing that came to mind was something I knew I shouldn't say because pastors aren't allowed to say those things and I'm not real quick on my feet what I should have yeah it is a good thing but what I should have said was I should have said look around you you see all these people that sit on hard chairs that, that move stuff around. I mean, we'd walk in there and there'd be no piano and we'd have to go all the way to the other end of the building to get the piano and roll it in. But people would do all this stuff. I, I, I should have said to them right then, that's the church. It's not the band room. It's not the building. It's not this building, even though we call it Faith Community Church. 
It's the people. You're the church because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit if you have your faith in Christ. And when you walk out this building, you don't leave Jesus behind. You don't, you don't leave God behind. That's an Old Testament concept. You have Christ within you. And that, to me, is so exciting to understand that and to know that. Well, things have come a long way in 40 years. Here we have a vibrant church filled with people who worship and serve God. They're volunteers. I mean, I can't even imagine how many volunteers it takes to even run BBS and things like that, you know? So all of that activity, all of that life is here. And yet I think it would be easy for someone who really didn't know much about the Bible or understand, you know, what's church all about to say, why do you guys do all this stuff? You know, why the money? And it costs a lot of money. You know, why the time? Why the energy? Why everybody putting all this, you know, uh, in, into this, this, this thing we call the church? And, you know, along with us, I mean, we've been here a while. Some of us have been here, amazingly, 40 years. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and at the beginning, I have to tell you, we would have never imagined we just didn't know. We knew God was up to something. We just didn't know what it was, where it was, or how it was going to look when it was finished. But, um, or it's not finished, but, but, but where it would look eventually. But, you know, it might be easy for us to say, you know, when people say, why do you do all this stuff? Well, we just do it, right? This is what you do. You go to church. This is what we've always done. This is what, you know, our parents did, and now we do it, and, and this is what we're supposed to be doing. So we go to church, and if we're not careful, we could easily find that we've lost our sense of purpose. So I'd like us to think for a few minutes about the purpose of Faith Community Church. Why Faith Community Church? And to answer that question, I'd like us to look in one of the most unique books, I think, in the Bible, and that is the book of Hosea, and that's back, now you wish you would have taken a Bible because I gave out the page, I'm going to give the page number, it's page 884, okay, but it's back in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, back in the white pages that you don't always get to, but it's the book of Hosea. And Hosea was a Jewish prophet who lived and wrote in the 8th century B.C. So we're talking about a long time ago. I mean, we're talking about 2,700, well, it'll be 2,800 years now that we're in this century. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with me? You know, what do I care about some guy who lived 2,800 years ago? Well, here's what happened. At that time, Israel, which was God's people, were rebellious, and they were split into two nations because of their rebellion. And there was a northern section and a southern section. And the northern section was called Israel or Ephraim. Kind of confusing because Israel was really the whole thing, but that part was called Israel. And Hosea was a prophet to that northern part of the kingdom. The book of Hosea covers about 40 years of his ministry to the people. And the people were stuck in this spiritual malaise, in this spiritual stupor. And you know what they did? They looked around and they said, look at all these religions around us. They have temple prostitutes. They have all kinds of things going on. Looks like a whole lot more fun than what we're doing. And these people just, you know, drifted off and they got into all of these various religions and things. And here's God's people. And God is trying to call them back. So he sends Hosea as a prophet to speak to him. And, you know, I believe they had lost their sense of the wonder of God. I believe they had lost their sense of the holiness and the awesomeness of God. The first thing I'd like us to see today is this. Faith Community Church exists because God loves us with an astonishing, amazing, indescribable, everlasting love. Look at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1 of Hosea. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Now, what, what the imagery that God used was he was the husband and Israel was his wife. And as they went after other gods, he called that har harlotry. It was spiritual harlotry. So he says to, to uh, Hosea, he says, I want you to marry a woman of harlotry. And so verse 3, he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. Here's what happens. God commands Hosea to either, you know, scholars are kind of divided on this. Was she a prostitute at that time? Was she going to become one? I don't know, but whatever. She was not a woman of good character. Now, this is a book of the Bible that makes us ask some really hard questions. And at first we look at that and we say, what? You know, how can that happen? 
How can the holy God of the universe who created marriage and said marriage is to be this, this amazing bond between a husband and a wife for a lifetime, and it's a picture of Christ in the church, and, you know, isn't that the God that we worship? Isn't that the God of the Bible? How could he tell one of his prophets to marry this immoral woman? Well, those questions, I believe, are exactly the point of Hosea. None of us, none, none of us guys, would choose to marry someone like Gomer. First of all, could you imagine marrying a girl named Gomer? You know? <laughs> you know what are you going to say? You're engaged and you walk up to your friends. Hey, guys, you want to meet my fiancé, Gomer? I, that just doesn't work well for me. Beyond that, she might have been a beautiful woman. We don't know. We're never told about her physical appearance. But she was not a beautiful person on the inside. She, she was a wicked person. And uh, we understand that from her character. But God commanded his godly prophet to marry this ungodly woman, and here's why. This was the way that Hosea and then Israel was going to get a glimpse of God's love for them, for them who are wayward, for them who are drifting, God's unbreakable love for them. This was the way that God was going to use Hosea as kind of like an, uh, an illustration to the people. Ed Welch writes this, God was saying to Hosea, in effect, you and I are both going to give our heart completely to someone who will utterly reject us. We will give all of our hearts energy and time in pursuit of them. By doing this, you, Hosea, will understand my faithful love for you and your people. You see, I myself am the husband. Your life will be about my love. Your pain will point to my own. Your faithfulness will replicate mine. This was Hosea's ordination to the ministry. <laughs> this is what I'm calling you to, Hosea. His contemporary Isaiah was a prophet who prophesied at the same time down in the southern part. And when you read about Hosea, uh, Isaiah's call to the ministry, it's very different. We understand why he, you know, said, here am I, send me. He got this great vision of God on the throne. You know, the angels going, holy, 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 you know, Lord God Almighty, the earth is full of his glory. And, you know, he sees all of this and he says, here am I, send me. We understand why he was impacted by the holiness and the righteousness of God. But Hosea gets to see another side of the very same God. See, we're not changing gods here. We're just changing sides of God. He's the same God. Hosea meets Gomer in the seat of sinners and witnesses the unfathomable love of the Holy One. That love was to be Hosea's message to Israel. It was an illustration. Again, he was like a living object lesson. So Hosea obeys, he marries Gomer, and they have their first child. Within a short time, two other children are born. And again, I don't know if they're his or not, you know, the, the scriptures don't give us all those details. It seems like at least the first one's his. But you would have thought, she would have said, you know what, I got a guy who loves me. I got a godly man for a husband. I got three beautiful children. You know, it seemed like she would be drawn to that. And yet she wasn't. And, and, and it, you know, it was completely different. And, and that's not what happens. Look at chapter 3 of Hosea and verse 1. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who took to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. Now, my wife said to me, what's with these raisin cakes? If you like raisins, it's okay. God's not against raisins. Raisin cakes were something that were used in pagan worship. And so that's why God, there's certain things in the Bible that God prohibited because of the fact that they were used by pagan people around them. So if you like raisins, that's okay. You're, you're allowed to eat them. But Gomer was openly committing adultery. Now, here's the point. As we read about the sham marriage, as we read about the broken heart of God, for the lives of his people, we have to ask this question. How could God love me? How could God call me his bride? Because that's what we are, the bride of Christ. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. And I have to believe Hosea was making that same connection. And he was saying, wait a minute. How, how does this God who is so holy, how does this God who is righteous, how does this God love us? He was beginning to fathom the, the width and the length and the height and the depth of God's love in his own life for, for Israel. And ultimately, Gomer was discarded by her lovers. She, I don't know, she got older. She was going through, she lived a hard life, you know. She ends up in the slave market. She ends up up there naked before the, you know, before the customers. She's being sold in the slave market. 
Gomer was done. Her adulteries had almost led her to the grave. You know, there's shame, there's fear, there's rejection. You know, she's bound. She's, you know, who knows what her family and friends and everybody else had said and thought about her. So the Lord says to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and committing adultery. And verse 2, so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. Bidding didn't go real high. She probably wasn't a hot commodity. But God said to to Hosea, he said, I want you to go there, and I want you to buy her back, and I want you to bring her back into your home. Now look at this, verse 3. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. Thus I will also be towards you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. We don't have time to go into all the meanings of these religious uh, things here right now. But afterward, the children of Israel shall return, seek the Lord their God and David their king, and the fear of the Lord and his goodness in the latter days." You know what Hosea does? He buys her out of that slave market and he says, we need to renew our vows. Right? Isn't that what he's saying to her? He's saying, you be faithful to me, I'm going to be faithful to you till death do us part. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of God's forgiveness for us through the death of his son is the greatest love story ever told. But there's one that comes right on the heels of, of that one, doesn't there? There's one that almost matches that one. And it's this story of what Hosea did with Gomer. Gomer wanted what she wanted. Gomer was going to look everywhere for, you know, find satisfaction. Anybody here ever do that? Any of us ever wander around in life like that? You know, we're kind of grabbing onto this and that and the next shiny thing, and I need a new one and a bigger one, and I need this or that person or, you know, yeah, my wife's whatever, and I need another one. And, you know, we, we, all these things go through our mind. That does not go through my mind. I just want you to know. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I, I love my wife very much, and I've never thought about uh, having another one. One's enough, okay, but, you know. No, I, I better stop now. Yeah. He knew it was impossible to satisfy his wife, but he kept pursuing her. He kept calling her, and, and he redeemed her, and he brought her back to her, her marriage. He brought him back to himself. Now, what was life like for Hosea? What was going on inside Hosea? What, what, what were his emotions? What did he feel like? Isn't it interesting? We're never told. We don't know. We can only guess. We can only imagine what must have been going on inside of him. You know, everybody gossiping in his family and everybody else putting the, the pressure on him. But what he says is this, I submitted myself to God and I obeyed. And I did what God called me to do. Now think about this. What was it like for God? What was going on inside of God? You know, usually when you're really hurt and someone embarrasses you and, you know, you're really kind of put aside, you, you, obviously you don't want to advertise that, you know. I mean, I guess some people would put it on Facebook, but most of us wouldn't do something like that. You know, we don't advertise our deepest feelings, but I want you to look at this. Look at Hosea chapter 11 and verse 8. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 8. This is what God says. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zebulun? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. Isn't that interesting? The, the high and mighty one, the lofty one, the one, the great I am. You know, he says, my heart churns within me. And that Hebrew word, havak, it means to be overthrown, actually. It's used like uh, when it talks about in Lamentations, Sodom was overthrown in a moment. You might translate that gut-wrenching. That's what we'd say today, right? This is gut-wrenching for me. This is the God of the universe saying this about his people. This is the passion that he has to bring his people back to himself. Does that surprise you? Does it surprise you that God would love a bunch of people like the Israelites? Does it surprise you that God would love a bunch of people like us? You know, I used to have people, I'd do counseling, and I'd have people say, well, I don't come to church because there's all those people there, and boy, they have it all together, and their families are great, and everything's fine. And I'm looking at them thinking, man, 
you should do the counseling I do, you know? <laughs> you should know what's going on. I'm not going to tell them, of course, because what happens there is, is, is not something you could talk about. But I'm th- I said to him, listen, you don't understand. We're all sinners. We all have these issues in life. We all have all kinds of things. You just can't see it in the hearts of people because obviously we don't display it. Listen, God loves us with this gut-wrenching love with a passionate, uh, immeasurable, you know, love, a reckless love, like the song says. And, and he does. And it wasn't like he doesn't have a choice. God had a choice, like, right? Uh, uh, Hosea had a choice. The choice was to love the unlovely. Aren't you glad God doesn't operate like we do? Aren't you glad doesn't, God doesn't make the decisions like we do, you know? Aren't you glad I'm not God? I'm glad you're not God, <laughs> okay? I'm glad God is God. You know, what would I have done if, if it was me? I probably wouldn't have gone that far with Gomer in the first place. But once she got to the slave market, I would have said, that's it, good riddance. This is done, right? God comes into the slave market and he says, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger for I am God, not man, the holy one in your midst, and I will not come with terror. What is it that holds back God's holy wrath? First Peter tells us, Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit. This, of course, is Old Testament. We're talking about Hebrew here. But when you go to the New Testament, there's three words that are translated redeem or redemption, depending on if it's the noun or the verb form. One of them is, and this is the most interesting to me, exagorazo. Ex means out, like you go out the exit. Agorazo is the verb form of agora. Agora was the open marketplace. We have a word in our language. We talk about agoraphobia, right? If you're afraid of being outside, if you don't like being outside, that's one of the weird things that happened to me uh, at first when I was going through the weird things I was experiencing. But uh, this is what it says. God comes into the slave market of sin, and he purchases us out, and he takes us out, and he calls us his own. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Ed. That might be true of Gomer, and it might be true of some people, but it's not true of me. I don't do all those things. You know, why are you talking about sin and all this? You know what God says? God says, stop comparing yourselves to other people. Because compared to other people, you might not be that bad. But God says, compare yourself to me. And when you compare yourself to the perfect, holy, righteous God of the universe, you and I aren't doing so good. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says we, God is perfect, heaven is perfect, we need to be perfect to be there, we're far from it. So God brings forgiveness and he covers us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that he can look upon us and he can call us his bride. He can call us his own. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stood in Gomer's place. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stood in our place, and he paid the wages of sin for us. Now look at this verse, Acts 13, 39. Everyone who joins Faith Community Church and gives a whole lot of money and does a whole lot of stuff for God gets eternal life. Is that what it says? What does it say? Everyone who believes, not works, joins, pays, turns, does whatever. Because it's not about us. It's not about what we do. Although all of those things can be important in living out our life as a Christian, but none of them are going to make us a Christian. Because if it did, then in all through eternity, we could sort of say, you know, all praise to us. Because we're better than the next guy. We'll never say that. The only thing we'll say is, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive all glory and power and honor. The Bible says this, and and this is so profound. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and this is from the New Testament now, quoting from Genesis 2, will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, which there's no other relationship spoken of in all the scriptures, not even a mother and child called one flesh. We are a husband and wife are one flesh. It's a holy relationship. And then this is the apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. God takes gomers who place their faith in him. He woos them to himself. Even as they wander, he woos them back to, and he calls them his bride. And he stops seeing him as wretched and he starts seeing him as covered with the holiness and the purity of Jesus Christ. 
So number one, this church exists. Faith Community Church exists because of the amazing love of God. Second of all, Faith Community Church exists because God has a job for us to do that's way bigger than any of us as individuals could ever accomplish. Way bigger. This country, we have a sense of individualism, don't we? You know, we can make it on our own. You know, we come into a room and we don't even, we want to leave a seat between us and the next person, right? We want to be ourselves. We want to be, you know, we, we have all these ideas. Our home is our castle and so forth. And uh, that mindset can spill over into just our church act life and, and how we live for God. And, and, and it can just in, inhibit us, I believe, from serving him. Think about some of the commands of scripture and make them singular instead of plural. Let me put myself in this. I have to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I have to make disciples of all nations. I have to pray without ceasing. I have to care for the widows who are in need. I have to teach the older men, the younger men. I have to teach the younger women. I have to do all that, and then I have to raise my family, go to work, you know, coach soccer, and every, it ain't going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. And do you think that sometimes the reason we don't fulfill the responsibilities that we can fulfill in the kingdom of God is because we think, I can't do all of that stuff, so we sort of back off and we say it's just too much. And we step back. What's the answer? The answer is that so many of the commands of the New Testament are given to the church. They're given on a corporate level. How are we ever going to reach this world for Jesus Christ? It's going to take people going. It's going to make people staying here and praying. It's going to take people giving money. It's going to take you standing at the back fence, you know, sharing the gospel with your neighbor. I mean, it takes all of us working together for these things to be accomplished. When we decided to build the first building, we had, uh, we had a meeting to figure out how we were going to pay for it. We had a, listen to this, I have a tape, a cassette tape of this. Anybody have a cassette player? I have a cassette tape of, I had to actually buy one to get some of my older messages and digitize them. I had to go on e eBay and buy a, uh, a, a, tape, a tape player. But anyway, we had a meeting, and in this meeting, which we met in the Knights of Columbus Hall, and that was unique in itself, but we didn't have a place to meet, a building, so we met there. We decided what kind of building we were going to build, who was going to build it, and how we were going to pay for it, and we did it all in one night in a few hours. I do not recommend that, okay, but we did it, and, and, and we were talking. We were mostly young families. We definitely weren't cash rich, small kids. You know, we're talking about how we're going to pay for it. We said, oh, well, we could, if those who have houses, we could, you know, maybe borrow some money against our house, or we could take out loans, we could do this and that, and God bless him, Ken Diamond, who is Eric Diamond and Paul Diamond's father, he gets up and he says, I believe that God wants us to trust him. I believe that we don't need to borrow money. I believe this is Faith Community Church, and we should have the faith to believe that God will supply the money. And amazingly, everybody said, wow, you know, you're right. Let's do that, okay? So we made a plan. We were going to have so much money by this time, and then a few months later, we were going to have so much money to build that first building. Um, I'll tell you, it was only $125,000 back then. Isn't that amazing that we built that first building? But we set those dates, and then we prayed, and you know what? We believe God, but none of us could have just gone out and done it ourselves. That, that's what it looked like, T111, you know, little... People never knew we were back here. We were back in the weeds. It was a, a dirt a road that went up here to a horse farm, you know? That's, and people would say, what is that building back there? We put a steeple on it so people could look from Route 3 and say, oh, that might be a church. You know? <laughs> anyway, we, we believed God, and, and, when, and it happened. And people came together, and they sacrificed, and they gave. And, you know, we had, <laughs> we're in church on Sunday, and all of a sudden they tell me, oh, we're going to come in Monday and put in the windows. And so we got to go out there and put on the, the, you know, the stain on the outside of the building. So you can't see the, the, the lady standing right there is the wife of the guy, the next guy. He's a doctor, and, she, and his wife. You know, all these people come out. They, I don't think they change from their Sunday clothes, but they're out there painting the, the stain on the outside of the building. We work together to see it happen. When it came to building this building, and if you don't know how it's laid out, when you go through those double doors, when you go out to the hall, foyer and you go through the double doors, you're in the old building, the 5,000 square foot building. When you go out the double doors to the other side, to their classrooms, you're walking out of that building. So the architect designed this building to kind of surround that one so it didn't look like we had a little building and a big building put together, and he did a great job. But it was going to cost $1.6 million, and we said, we have to trust God. This is faith community church. I tell you what, 
Talk about being driven to your knees. And I don't know about the rest of the congregation, but the guy who was up here responsible, he was laying awake at night thinking, what have we got ourselves into? But we knew that God was going to see us through. And, and I could tell you a hundred stories about what people did. We did crazy stuff. One, <laughs> one week when we were in the other building, one Sunday we gave out money. We gave money to everybody. What was it, 20 bucks to adults and $5 to kids or something, $10? To, I can't remember. We gave everybody money in the church. It was their money anyway. They gave it. We just didn't tell them that. We said, <laughs> and we gave everybody money and we said, you can do whatever you want with it. You go to McDonald's, you can buy, you know, something for yourself. But I had preached on the little boy and the feeding of the 5,000 and him bringing the loaves and fishes. And I said, here's what we want to encourage you to do. We want you to take this little bit of money and we want you to pray and ask how God could multiply that. And man, I want to tell you what, kids like made birdhouses and sold them and all this kind of stuff. And it was just amazing. We didn't get a million dollars from that, but we sure got a lot of people involved and, and it changed a lot of people's lives. And, uh, it, you know, we wanted everybody to feel like they have a part. And along the way, we discovered something. There were still some people who kind of sat back and had this mentality. And we do this all the time with things. You know, I can't do it all, so I'm not going to do anything. I can't, you know, it's like, well, I don't have a million dollars. And, you know, so I'm just going to sit back and, and kind of watch what happens. And so we said, how can we get every single person involved? And we started the elephant campaign. Now, you might wonder why we called it that. It's because how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Okay. So we said, this is how we're going to do it. Everybody can do it. We wanted the people to be involved because it's their church. We wanted, when this church was uh, inaugurated and, and everybody came in and we had the first service, we wanted every single person, every child, everybody to say, you know what? Th this is part of me. God allowed me to have a part in this. And in the end... God supplied the money, and, and uh, Jim Johnson put on an elephant costume and, and went down the aisle and had a big thing that said the church is paid for. I said to Jim, where are we going to get an elephant costume? He says, we live outside of Washington, D.C. Don't you think there'll be a few elephant costumes around? <laughs> you know what? We believe God is not interested in raising money because God is not poor. God owns it all. God is interested in raising his children. And that's why we did what we did. And that's why it's so important to live and walk by faith. And in the end, it got done. Remember, we're Gomer turned bride of Christ. What does God want for his bride's body? The Bible tells us this, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. I'm one body, right? Many parts. And all the parts don't work like they used to, but many parts. But I'm one body, and that's what the church is. That's what we are. And it's kind of a humorous passage if you read through 1 Corinthians 12. It says, what if, the, you know, what if it was just an eye? Where would the hearing be or the smelling? Could you imagine a big eyeball just sitting up here looking at you, you know? What could be accomplished? But we're all different, and we all fit together in this thing called the church. And, uh, you know, it goes on to say some other things that are just kind of funny if you read through it. But that's how desperately we need one another if we're going to engage our families, our community, and ultimately our world for Jesus Christ. Now listen, God loved Israel because he established them. He chose out a man named Abram. He made promises to him. He said, your descendants are going to be great. He says, through you, all the world will be blessed. And you know what happened through Israel? Even though they wandered and even though they ran away and even though they went off after other gods and God kept having to bring them back, through Israel came the Bible. The Jews brought us the Bible, right? I mean, all the writers of Scripture maybe except Luke were, were, uh, were Jewish. So we got the Bible. We have Jesus Christ, the most important Jewish person who ever lived because through him all the people of the earth would be blessed. And they needed to understand that God was too phenomenally great and awesome for any one person to bring him the glory that he deserves on their own. Now here we are. We're the body. Are we perfect? we have any perfect people in here? I'd like to meet you. Any sinners in here? Any imperfect people in here? Any gomers in here? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I hear people talk about the church like it's an obstacle rather than it's part of what God's method is for, for reaching the world and accomplishing his goals. 
You know, I know a guy, this is a true story. I know a guy, he told me when he was five or six years old, he was at an evening service in a little country church, and he was sleeping on the front pew because it was nighttime and he was tired, and he's a kid, and the pastor stopped his sermon, and he walked down off the pulpit, and he hit him, and he woke him up, and he made an example of him, and he never went back to church again. He was a grown man, and he said, I will never step my foot in a church again. Some people are angry at the church. Somebody's hurt them. Someone's disappointed them. They reject the idea of church. Maybe they saw some people acting hypocritically and sinfully, and so they, they leave the church. I always tell people not going to church because you think there's too many hypocrites is like not going to the hospital when you're sick because you think there's too many sick people there. This is a hospital. This is a place of healing, and we need that. We all need that. See, someone else said, you know, if there's a hypocrite standing between you and God, they're closer to God than you are. <laughs> you know what? More people laughed at that joke than my joke. Okay. <laughs> so it's completely foreign to the Bible to do life without, you know, without God. Two greatest commandments are love God and love people. The path we're supposed to walk down is to accomplish those goals in our life and the opportunities that we have. But you know what happens? It gets a little bumpy because the Gomer parts keep popping out, right? And it makes it a little rough to accomplish, and that's why we need each other to encourage and challenge and admonish and everything else. That's the way it's always been. People say to me, you know, I wish I was back in the early church where it was really pure and we didn't have all these problems like today. And I said, you ever read Romans or First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon? You know, all these letters to the churches are written to deal with problems, and most of them are people problems because we're people that will always be problems. If you think about it, you know, I love the ministry. It's the people that are, you know, that are difficult. To, that's an old pastor joke. Uh, if you think about it, God could have protected himself from all the pain and all the disappointment. He could have just wiped out everybody. He didn't have to tell Noah to build that boat, right? He just wiped out the world. Everybody be gone. No people, no problems. Everything's fine. Instead, God physically preserved the human race. He even wrote, this is, this is just, I mean, how do you, even wrap your mind around this. The God of the universe wrapped himself in human flesh and he walked this earth so that he would know what it's like to be lonely, what it's like to be hungry, what it's like to feel abandoned. He knows all of those things that we feel because he came into this world to be our redeemer, to be our savior. We have the example of God himself. He didn't need us. He didn't need anyone else. When he was on the mountain with Moses and Moses says, who should I say is sending me? He said, I am. That's it. Tell them I am sent you. You know, the word Jehovah that, the, that is the name for God, the Hebrew name for God, uh, we don't actually know how it's pronounced, but it's four letters in Hebrew, yod heh bub heh It's, it's um, a word that comes from the verb to be. That's, that's what God says. I just am. I am. And, and isn't it interesting? You know, if we weren't here, God would be okay. Some people, I, I read one book and a guy said, you know why God created people? Because he's, he's loving. Could you imagine being loving and having no one to love? Did you know from eternity past, there was perfect love in the Trinity? No problem. God wasn't lonely. You know, God was doing fine. He created us for a reason. And that reason, the main reason, is to bring glory and honor to him. He chose to personally and intimately involve himself in our lives, and he did it because he loves us with an astonishing love, and he's got a job for us to do that's way bigger than any of us as individuals. So why Faith Community Church? Why all the money? Why all the activity? Why the time? Why the effort? What's it all about? Listen to this, Colossians 1. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in all things he might have the preeminence. We want to make it all about us, don't we? We want to have the preeminence. And the Bible says in all things that he might have the preeminence. Why Faith Community Church? The purpose of this church is to introduce people to Jesus Christ and to equip them to become his devoted followers. Why? So that they might give him all the preeminence. So that they might give him all the glory. As, as stumbling and bumbling as we are in that process, so that we might be the ones to bring him glory. So I'll, I'll close with this. Calling all gomers. Okay? Calling all gomers. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Not something you've done, but have you put your faith and trust in him alone 
his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Let me close with the simplest verse in the Bible. I like simple stuff. It's got to be really plain for me to understand it, right? Here's the simplest verse in the Bible. Every word in this verse only has one syllable. Is that simple enough for you? Okay. (laughs) He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Do you have the Son of God? Have you received him? Have you placed your faith in him? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your graciousness. We thank you for your example. We thank you for Hosea and and the willingness or whatever he went through to, to obey you, but he did it and he obeyed you and he gave us that example. And Father, help us to see you in that example and help us to understand this amazing love of God that looks at us not because we're so lovely, but he but you look at us because you've set your love upon us, you've given your son for us, and you've said, I care for you and I call you to worship. I call you to honor me. I call you to give me the preeminence in all things. Father, forgive us for all the times we don't do that. Forgive us for all the times we fail. But Father, thank you that you said to Israel, I'm not going to come and destroy because I'm not a man, I'm God. And this is the way I do things. Father, thank you that you love us that much, you care for us. You have a plan and a purpose for us, and you have a plan and a purpose for this church. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.